I'd like for you to turn this morning to Luke chapter 1. If we have enough time, we will cover two passages of Scripture. Uh, and the first one, God creates a problem, and the second one, He solves it. So I hope, hopefully we can do that. Let's begin by reading, uh, well, just, a, just a little background. First part of, of, of Luke chapter 2 is the angel appearing before uh, Zacharias, telling him about the birth of John the Baptist, another miraculous birth. Uh, his wife had been barren and now was past the age when she should be able to bear children. And he was incredulous, and so he was uh, rebuked with muteness, could not speak. And um, so that gives us context for the verse we're going to read in verse 26. Let us pray. Lord, as we open thy word, <laughs> open our hearts. As we search your scriptures, Lord, may, may you search us and may we respond to what is going on in our hearts through your word and your Holy Spirit and do the right thing. Lord, bless this time that we have together with the things of the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse Acts one twenty six and the sixth month, that's the sixth month of Elizabeth, John the Baptist's mother's pregnancy. In the, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God in, unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a name to a man whose name was Joseph the, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then Mary said unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing shall be, that shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be unto, unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Mary lived in the little, I mean little. They think that there may have been fewer than 200, 250 people in the tiny village of Nazareth. It was very close to a city that was being built there called Sepphoris. It was a totally Gentile city. We think that it's very possible that Joseph worked there and that later, later Jesus worked there. It was like two and a half miles away. And there would have been great need for carpenters or literally the, the Greek word is technion from which we get a technician so they might very well have been more than, and probably were more than carpenters. Uh, I, I doubt seriously with a village as small as Nazareth that Joseph could have made of a living doing nothing but carpentry work. So he probably had other skills uh, that, was, that were related uh, to construction, making furniture, uh, yokes, and all that sort of thing. It says a spouse to a man named Joseph. Now we have nothing, nothing whatsoever in our society that corresponds to a spousal. Uh, we won't go into it in great detail, but essentially the couple was married, but they had not begun living together as husband and wife. It took a divorce to end a, an espousal. It was a legally binding contract. The vows were made at, on the evening of the espousal and the wedding 
was that was just a big seven day feast. And so that was her condition. The word it says a, a virgin, a spouse. Uh, the word virgin here is the Greek word uh, parthenos. As we get the, the word for the temple, the Greek temple Parthenon, it means an absolute virgin. Now, Mary means is Greek for Miriam. She was a Jewish woman, uh, and she would have gone in her society by the name of Miriam. She's called Mary by virtue of uh, the Greek. And he says here that the angel came in unto her. I remember seeing a Christian film where Mary's out outside. I don't think so. It says he came in unto her. She was in her home. This was a very private meeting where she told the angel told Mary what was going to happen. It says, Hail thou that are highly favored. Now, the word highly favored here literally means greatly graced. And what is grace? Grace is getting something that we do, something good that we do not deserve. Now, was, and then the letter says, Blessed art thou among women. She was given a great privilege. Uh, by, by the way, it says, Blessed art thou among women. If you go back and, and read in, in the book of uh, uh, Judges about, oh man, her name just escapes my, drove the, the tent peg into the, the sisters. Jail. Jail, yeah. Shouldn't know that. Jail in the nail. Uh, it says, that she is that she is blessed above women. So, what were the Old Testament requirements for the mother of the Messiah? Now, now let, let, let us. I want us to. I want us to be accurate here. I want us to be absolutely accurate. There's so much of this, and I speak much of it, of this overreaction, this reactionary interpretation of Scripture, because some group, some denomination, some church abuses it. We should not, we should never, ever disparage Mary. Whatever violence doctrinally that has been done to her had nothing to do with her. It was what was done subsequent by those who have a problem, a doctrinal problem. By the same token, at the same time, we should not disparage her. We should not overly exalt her. She says in the Magnificat, which is in, later on in this chapter, she says that she rejoices in God, her Savior. She needed to be saved just like you and I. The Lord Jesus Christ died for his, the sins of his very own mother. But she was a good woman. But there are four qualifications for the mother of the Messiah. First of all, she had to be Jewish. The blessing was to come through the Jews. Eve, when God gave to her, well, actually, He gave it to Satan and Adam and Eve were eavesdropping. He says, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. That seed means descendants. It shall bruise thy, uh, thou shall bru it shall bruise thy head. That's how you kill a snake. And it shall, and thou shall bruise his heel. A bruising of a heel is a non-lethal injury. It's uh, essentially a nothing. Now I'm not taking anything away from the. Uh, the the great suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Satan did nothing, essentially, to the Lord Jesus Christ. He was totally victorious. Mm -hmm. Everything that was done to him was, was foretold. Everything that was done to him was planned. It was all according to God. And Satan thought, I truly believe, that he had won a great victory. And in, 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 in reality, he had been defeated on a scale which he, even in his great wisdom, could not even comprehend. But we have in the Bible what's known as progressive revelation. More and more and more information is given. 
Now we won't look up the verses, we're rather in a little bit of a hurry today. The second qualification is she had to be of the tribe of Judah. So, if to be Jewish eliminates all the other women, all you ladies in here would have been eliminated, okay? You're not Jewish. Had to have been of the tribe of Judah. So that means that the, the, the wives, of the, the women of all the other tribes, even, even the tribe of Levi, were eliminated. So 13 tribes, in a way, were eliminated, those, those ladies. Had to be of the family of David. So that means that all the other families in the tribe of Judah that were not the family of David, those ladies could not be the mother of the Messiah. And Galatians 4.4 4 tells us that it was at the appointed time, but when the fullness of time was come. So that means that all the ladies, the, the Jewish ladies of the tribe of Judah, the family of David, that were not at that time, were not, it was not possible for them to be the mother of the Messiah. Was she the holiest woman that ever lived? I don't know. You don't know. No one knows. She was a good woman. She was the woman that God chose according to these stipulations. Amen. And the Bible tells us here that when the when the angel spoke his salutation, that she was troubled. She was troubled, verse 29, at his saying. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. But secondly, she was troubled at his presence. How do we know that? Because in verse 30, it says, The angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary. Uh, do, you, do you notice, do we, do we see a pattern here how that when people in, in, that, in the Christmas story see the angels, it's, uh, it's scary. Mm -hmm. Now, that, that doesn't mean that every time an angel makes an appearance that it's a frightening thing. We can look back in the Old Testament and we see that the people were not aware that this was that the person speaking to them was an angel. It tells us in Hebrews 13 too, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. You may have unknowingly had some something to do with an angelic being, but you didn't know. And so you were not afraid. But this obviously was a superhuman entity that appeared before her and he told her to fear not. Not only do we see the salutation, but we see the substance of what the angel had to say. Beginning in verse 31, he talks about Jesus. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Yeshua. Yahashua. He was the Savior. Amen. And it tells us here of that he is Messiah. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. These are messianic promises. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Amen. But folks, that's yet to be. What did Jesus say when he was being tried? He said, if my kingdom were of this world, then would my disciples fight. And had his kingdom been of this world at that time, nothing could have stopped. He had the power to immediately sit upon the throne of David, but that was not yet God's program. Folks, understand God is never, ever thwarted. God is never kept from doing His will. And it was not the time for Him to sit, sit on His throne. That will be in the future. But what he's saying to, to Mary, which she would have understood perfectly, is that you are going to fulfill the promise made to Eve, or made, yeah, made to Eve, and that you are going to be the mother of the Messiah. 
this would have been what was said here by the angel would have been understood perfectly. And this fit very much with what they were expecting. The problem that the Jew, one of the problems, there were a number of problems, but one of the, one of the problems the Jews had with Jesus in his day, and the, the, the problem that the Jews today have with Jesus is he did not fulfill this. And it was not a failure. It is a matter of time. And when the time, and just in the same way that in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law. He fulfilled that redemption in the same manner. And this is spoken of in Romans eleven twenty five. 25. For I would not rather that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. We are in the time of the Gentiles. And when that is full, when it's finished, when it is complete, the Messiah will come back. Now, first, he will take his church out of the world. And we know the prophecy, so we will not continue. But she has a question. And it's a very logical, reasonable question. She says, how can this be, seeing I know not a man? She says, I am not having sexual relations. That's yet to be. I'm a spouse. So how is this going to be? So she was probably expecting that he would say, well, you'll get married. And, you know, but that's not the way. For you see, any son of Joseph and Mary would have had a sinful nature just like you and I do. You have a sinful nature. Right. Now, I may have not seen it. I have a sinful nature. My wife has seen it. Even, poor, even my father-in-law three months has seen it. All right? Okay. It's, it's apparent. Jesus had no sinful nature. So although he was human, although he laid aside his glory in heaven and came upon came down from that glory and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man, a man that could die. He did not have a sinful nature. Right. And so, starting in verse 35, the angel answers her question. Now, verse 35 is a very, very familiar verse. If you've uh, gone to Bible school or even been in good Sunday schools, you may well have memorized this verse. And the angel answered and said unto her, he's going to, shall we say, explain the how? The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Amen. We have a absolutely, completely unique occurrence here. Something that has never occurred and never will occur whereby a spiritual being causes a woman to have a child. This is what we know as the virgin birth. And as we will see a little bit later, Mary continued to be a virgin until this child was born. So this is the, next, the explanation of the incarnation. This is how it happened. And then he speaks of an additional miracle, one that Mary herself would get to see. Verse 36, and he says, Behold thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. Amen. You know, folks, sometimes we like to see some evidence. If you read the Bible through, and I, and I hope you do that, that you try to read, and like in 2021, that you try to read the Bible through from Genesis to Revelation. But if you do, and if you have, you see that God 
often gives evidence he gives evidence. He does not ask us to check our brain at the door and just take a huge leap of faith. As I've often said, for God many times, faith is an extension of knowledge. In other words, God takes us this far and he asks us to believe this far. Now we, we know that Mary went to see Elizabeth mm -hmm. and she saw her pregnancy. You see, this was, this was an evidential revelation to her that what the angel was saying would be true because her barren elderly cousin was pregnant. So we see the salutation, we see the substance, and now we see the surrender. Verse 38, and Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Now I'm going to use a word that may offend you ladies, but please, no offense is meant. She was will we she see her here, her willingness to be God's instrument, God's vehicle, God's means. God's way. She says, here is my body. And you know, that's what God wants of all of us. Romans 12, what I beseech you. Paul says, I beg, I plead. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, as the according to the mercies of God, that you present your body. Now, the body there, is, I, I truly believe, is far more than simply this physical body. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, but which is your reasonable service. It's reasonable because of what he has done for us. Amen. You know, sometimes things are, we've all been around unreasonable people, haven't we? Uh, and, and probably most of us, at least on a time, on occasion or two, have been reason, unreasonable. But he says the sacrifice of your body, the, the, the presentation of your body as a living sacrifice is reasonable because of what God has done for us. Right. So she was willing to be God's means of bringing the Messiah into the world. Amen. Now we don't know what she thought. It's sometimes the brevity, brevity of Scripture is almost astounding, but God, didn't, God did not see fit to tell us what Mary was thinking. But she was willing. Now this would create a very difficult consequence. I, I want you to hold, uh, hold your space here, and I want us to turn back to the book of Proverbs chapter 6. In Proverbs 6, Solomon is talking to his son. And in this in this, these, this, this passage of Scripture, and it goes on for several chapters, 5, 6, and 7, he's talking to his son about the strange woman. Now, when he says here, the strange woman, he does not mean the weird woman, okay? He's not talking about a woman that's really unusual. Uh, the word strange woman, <laughs> means foreign, and most specifically, and, he, and he's not even talking about foreign women in the sense of they're from a different country, but he's talking about the woman, not your wife. Now, I, I, I go through all of this because I, I want us to understand this is the context of what's being said, and as we read the verses we're about to read, you say, well, that's talking about a man. Well, that's because he's talking to a man. It is no less true about if, if this were addressed to a woman. Now, there, there will be certain things that are, if a woman is guilty of this, that will be true of a woman that would not be true of a man, and true of a man that would not be true of a woman. But there, there's one thing that they share, and that's what is found here. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 32, it says, But whoso committeth adultery with the woman lacketh understanding. 
I'm just going to sit on this for a while. I want to tell you what it means. It means the person that does this is clueless. Clueless. Now, how can you be clueless? Well, let us suppose that I was in a, um, I was down in South America, or I was in some place where they, they have what we, we, we kind of call these Stone Age people. Uh, they're, they're, they're extremely primitive. And Stone Age is kind of like my little track phone here, okay? But let's suppose that a, 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 a native uh, in a Stone Age culture found my phone. And so he messes around with it and he, he turns it on. He goes, oh. And, and then, he, then, he, then he messes around with it and, and, he, and, and finally he gets it he really gets it on. Oh, pretty picture. Beautiful yellow car. And he doesn't even know what a car is. All right? And so he's got this thing, and it, it beeps, and it, and, it, and it makes noises and all that, and he plays with it until the battery's dead. But essentially, folks, he's clueless. He doesn't know what this is supposed to be do. He doesn't know... Even though it's very a very crude phone, he doesn't know you can make phone calls with it because he doesn't know what a phone is. And, and, and there's nobody he knows that's got one anyway, so what does it matter? All right? He doesn't know that it will tell him the time because time not means nothing to him. If, if, if the sun is, comes up in the morning, it's time to get up. When the sun goes down at night, then, you know, then, you know he lives by the sun. He lives by... He, he has no concept of what this primitive little phone is supposed to do. Whoso committed adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. You're clueless. You don't know what you don't know what you're doing. You don't know what the sexual relationship is supposed to be. You have messed up big time. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. Mm -hmm. Then he speaks about what will happen in, as, it, as he relate, that person relates to society. He says, a wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. Folks, I'm here to tell you something. Humanly speaking, God messed up Mary's That woman, that pure, godly woman lived with a mark against her all of her life. You go to John chapter 2, 33, 30, over 30 years later. And she speaks to Jesus about doing something for that, the couple that has run out of wine. You know what she's asking? She's saying, I know who you are. Do something. Do something miraculous so that people might know that you are not just anyone. Mm. Folks, let me tell you something. The will of God is not necessarily a nice, neat little package. We are called on as children of God to go with him without the camp, bearing his reproach. Amen. It is an astounding thing how much Jesus is hated. But folks, let me, let, me, you, let me tell you why Jesus is hated. He was the living embodiment of the abject, abject failure of mankind. And the more, the, the more, the closer you get to the truth of who he was and what he accomplished, the greater reproach he is on mankind because he said, you are inadequate. Your sin, your righteousnesses are as filthy rags. There is nothing, absolutely nothing that you can do in and of yourself to gain a place in God's presence. And you know what, folks? People don't like that. That's embarrassing. 
It's a terrible thing to be told that. You see, God had created a crisis and he was going to handle it. Mm -hmm. Now you see, I know I'm going over time, but I get a, I get a fit. Well, let's, let's just put it this way, very quickly. In Matthew chapter 1, verses 18, 25, we see God's, we see the solution. Solution. Now, it didn't solve the problem in every regard, but Joseph was in a horrible quandary. He was a spouse to this woman, and, a, and, and when, a, when a person committed adultery, and it was not fornication, it was adultery. When he, committed, he or she committed adultery during an espousal, it took a divorce. In theory, she was, could have been subject to stoning. Now, they almost never did that, practically never did. Maybe never did it at that time, but it was nevertheless there. She had been away in the hill country of Judea to be with her cousin, and she comes back, and she's with a child. And a myriad of emotions must have passed through Joseph's heart and mind. Disbelief, how could his, how could his lovely, innocent Mary do this? Disappointment. He was so disappointed. He was disappointed in, in, in the fact that she would do something like that. He was disappointed that now he wouldn't marry her. He was disappointed on, and we could just go on and on. He was probably in shock. Just absolute shock. How could this be? Maybe there was some anger. There was no doubt grief. And probably some other emotions as well. The question was, what would he do? What should he do? The Bible says that being a just man, Joseph was a good man. God, God's commentary on him says he was. So he wanted to know what should he do? And then there's divine intervention. Verse 20, it says, And while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth the Son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. And then the, then the angel of the Lord tells Joseph that this is in reality the fulfillment of a, old, of a biblical, of a scriptural prophecy. And he obeys. Verse 24, Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not, till she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus. Which is your reasonable <coughs> service. Mm -hmm. Which is your reasonable service. Amen. In other words, folks, you don't know where God's going to take you if you surrender yourself to Him. But it's a reasonable thing to do. And I'm not telling you, and I would not tell you, and I could not tell you if I if I examine Scripture to tell I could not tell you that all everything's going to be well in the sense that it's just going to be just fine. The Bible never promises us that. But in closing, let me just say this. What does it say in Romans chapter 8? It tells us that, and I just thought of this, so I'm going to have to quote it as it comes to mind. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be re revealed in us. Understand, folks. God is debtor to no man. 
now, now let me talk about debt. Some people some people get a little crazy when they talk about debt. Okay. I bought a house twenty almost getting close to twenty seven years ago, twenty six and a half anyway. And I borrowed a certain amount of money. And the, the, the arrangement was that I would pay that money back in increments. That I would pay the, the, the mortgage payment itself in addition to the taxes, a twelfth of the taxes and, and a twelfth of the, of the insurance. And that I would pay that back month by month in a total of 361 payments. Now, I didn't owe that money until it was time to pay it. In other words, if, if I still had that mortgage, I, don't, I wouldn't owe January's payment. I wouldn't owe January's payment until it was January the 1st. And that's very important because, folks, understand something. There's, some, there's, a, there's a branch of Christianity that thinks that if you follow the Lord and you do everything you're supposed to do, everything's going to work out. And if everything doesn't work out, then you must have blown it somehow. Well, I can tell you I blew it somehow. And so did you. Now, that's not what the Bible teaches. But listen, understand. God is debtor to no person. And there will be a gap between what you do and what how you are rewarded. But when it's all said and done, God gives better than he asked for. I am convinced that nothing in this world is to be compared with what God has prepared for us. And folks, I look at things one of the one of the favorite little like five minute videos I like to watch is Winston Churchill's funeral. I like to watch it. I like to watch watch the one that says "I vow to thee," which is kind of the second British national anthem. It's from the music itself is done by the Czech uh, orchestra, and it is was written by um, Holst. And I can never seem to remember his first name, except when I don't need it. Right. But anyway, this wonderful parade. Now, are there going to be parades in heaven? I don't know, but I got news for, for you folks. There's some lonely, discouraged, despondent missionary somewhere. It's going to be treated, I believe it's going to be treated better in heaven. Winston Churchill was, a, was honored on those days. I believe it. I don't believe there's anything on this earth better than what is there. Mary suffered. Folks, there's different kinds of suffering. And she suffered. You can believe that in that little tiny village, those ladies were shocked too. They were surprised. Perhaps some of them were disappointed, but boy, they loved to get in the digs. They loved to throw those female bar bars. And you can believe that Joseph in that tiny place was condemned. What did you marry that, that defiled woman for? You can't do any better than that. Surely, Joseph, you didn't have to marry Mary. You could, have, you could have had some other woman. You could have put her away and had a better woman. Believe me, it was brutal. Like nothing you probably have ever experienced. And it didn't go away. Now, possibly after years of her godly life, people began to lighten up. God's will is not always an easy thing. And those who expect it find themselves disillusioned. And I've known people that have left the ministry because it wasn't what they thought. It was harder. There was reproach. There was privation. There was this or that or something else. I find no rose gardens at all. But 
God is debtor in the final end. He is debtor to no one. No believer will ever give anything for that for which he will not be abundantly rewarded. And the strange thing it says, if we had done everything that we were supposed to do, we would still be unprofitable servants. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that the will of God sometimes is messy, but Lord, you reward. There is that reward here, that, that fulfillment, that joy, that sense that we, we have something that the world cannot know about and you have given it to us. It is of your doing. And one day, whatever we have suffered, we will be rewarded richly for it. Those that suffer with you will reign with you. Lord, you will do mighty and wonderful things on our behalf. And heaven will be filled with grace piled upon grace upon grace upon grace. Let us not forget, in Jesus' name.